share my slides um, with you. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of the slide, um, there's an indication of a link that you can go to to revisit the materials. Um, that link's not live just yet. I'll do that this afternoon, so don't try and get ahead uh, by looking at that. But um, if ever there's stuff that we don't have time to go into in depth or stuff that you want to revisit, then have a look at the link um, at the bottom there. So can everybody see my slides? I'm assuming that you can. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, I'm Cara Thompson. So my background is I've got a PhD in psychology. Um, and I went from that to analysing postgraduate medical examinations and um, did that for about a decade um, and then um, ended up going freelance as a data viz consultant specialising in data viz and in enhanced reproducible outputs. So that's kind of getting you straight from your data to a nice set of plots or a quarter slide deck or a nice document um, and doing it in style um, so that you can tell your stories really well and saves you time um, and it means that your expertise gets out there quickly. Um, and that's really what drives me. It's maximizing the impact of other people's expertise. And today I'm going to be doing that by giving you um, some tips and tricks to make the most of your own plots. Uh, we're going to explore how to be a bit less dependent on annotations, which I know is a bit odd considering the title, but trust me. Uh, we're going to illustrate ways in which we can use colour and font to add some text hierarchy and to enhance the storytelling of our plots. Um, I'm going to give you reusable code um, when we implement these tips, and I'm going to introduce some of my favourite packages for annotations. Um, and as I said, we're going to point to additional resources that you can explore in your own time. And, and once I'm done talking, we will have a look at your own plots uh, for those of you that have brought them. I know that Rita has sent me one already, so we'll take a look at Rita's plots, and if anyone else feels brave enough, um, then we can have a look at that as well. But before we get going on the thing, I'm going to ask you to take a moment and suspend all disbelief and follow me in an adventure about what the Palmer Penguins got up to last weekend. And last weekend, the Palmer Penguins decided to run a baking competition um, in which they would pit the different species against each other um, and set different conditions for their bakes. Yes, we are going for the Great Penguin Bake Off. Um, those of you who've seen my talks before may have seen this a little bit already. Um, and if you want to look at it in more detail, go and have a look at the NHS talks that I gave because that was, uh, I took it to a whole new level. But let's imagine that our penguins were given bananas of different ripeness in the different species. Um, and the higher the bar, the yummier the cake. Um, and this is our plot. And obviously there's no legend. Um, but if I just change the colours like this, you can fairly easily guess which species was given the underripe green bananas. Um, which one got the ripe bananas and which one got the overripe bananas. Um, the Adelie penguins decided to mix things up a little bit and they went for different quantities of green banana in their mix. Um, and again, just by changing the colours, you can get a rough idea of which island decided to go for which quantities of banana. Um, and finally, they'd all decided to leave their bakes um, in the oven for a different amount of time. Then if I ask you which species left their cake in the oven for the longest, you might start to kind of tilt your head to the side. And um, if you ever find yourself doing that when you're looking at, at a plot, consider flipping it the other way around. Um, I find that duration runs from left to right and it makes it easier to conceptualize when you're doing this. Um, so that's the end of our episode of uh, The Great Penguin Bake Off. And if you start to worry that I've lost the plot, pun intended, um, that is not the case. It's just to illustrate our first point, which is to try and use color and orientation purposefully uh, when we're creating our plots. So without further ado, um, let's get coding. We're going to be using the tooth growth um, data set, which is um, part of the um, data sets that are built in to ARM. So you can reuse this in your own time um, if you want to. Um, I'm going to be using namespacing. So that's calling the package and then the function from it. And that's just to help. Well, A, it's good practice when you're writing code because it avoids contaminating um, functions with functions that have the same names in different packages. But it also will allow you to very easily see um, which um, packages each of the functions have come from. Um, I thought this was an intriguing data set. It's also a bit of a personal challenge to not use the penguins for a change. Um, and it has a research question in it with a pattern to visualize and annotate. So I thought this would be a good thing to use in our context um, that would be useful for you. And um, this is people's lunch break, so feel free to munch along with our guinea pigs as well. Uh, oh, I just lost the slides. There we go. Yeah. 
So let's set up our first basic plot and have a look at a few tips um, along the way. So we're going to pipe the data straight into ggplot, um, but first we are going to summarize it. So we're going to group them. Um, the guinea pigs in this data set were given a different supplement, which is either orange juice or vitamin C. Um, and then they were given it in different doses, and then they were looking at the length of the teeth um, or the growth of the teeth over time. So we're going to pipe the data in, we're going to group it uh, by supplement and by dose. We're going to grab the uh, mean length of the teeth, and then we're going to plot that. So on our x-axis, we're going to have dose. On the y-axis, we're going to have the mean length, and then we're going to color them by supplement. Um, and we're going to just use a geom a bar to do that to create the bar plot. So here we go. First bar plot, fairly straightforward, but it doesn't really make sense to stack these bars. So we're going to add position dodge to move them so that they're side by side. Um, we're going to add a little white line around the edge of the bars just to make them stand out a little bit. And you can control the width of that bar um, using size. Um, and then the first little tip that we're going to go for is to get rid of abbreviations if you can. So we're going to do a quick mutate call and create a supplement variable, uh, which translates um, the OJ into orange juice and the VC into vitamin C, so that when, when we plot it, um, it's a bit clearer what's going on. Um, we then have to make sure that we align the plot data with that. So we group it by supplement, and then the fill is supplement as well. So here you can see we've gone from it saying, um, OJ and VC to it saying orange juice and vitamin C. There are other ways of doing this, but I think this is a nice way of making sure that your data um, lines up with your plot in a way that allows you to intuitively see it when you go back and revisit. The next mini tip is to change the theme minimal. I encourage you to do that um, at the same instance that you can when you're creating a plot that just declutters it um, a little bit. Um, and then we're going to turn our dose um, into a categorical variable because there was a bit of a gap here in the plot that doesn't really make sense for the, the way that we're reporting it. But don't worry, if you're worried about that, we'll come back and do a scatter plot later. Um, this just helps it sum up for the bar plot purposes. And then we're going to wrap it using a facet wrap so that we're separating out the vitamin C um, and the, the critical, um, the, the orange juice as well. Um, then we're going to add some text. Finally, we've got the annotation. So we're adding in a title. We're adding in the axis titles. Um, and uh, we're adding a wee subtitle in there as well so that we can see what it is that we're trying to tell as a story. So we get to this point, and we've got a perfectly functional ggplot with a title and a story to tell. But I'm looking at this, and I can't help but feel a little bit like this kitten. There's just, there's a lot of information going on there. Where am I looking? Am I looking at the legend or at the colors and the title and the subtitle? And it's just all a little bit mad. And um, so we're going to try a few things um, that will help us make more sense of this. And the first thing is to try and use some color. So how do we use color to tell this story? Well, it's about orange juice and vitamin C. So let's just start with um, some orange juice. I find it quite easy to start with photos. I find it quite hard to come up with colors just out of nowhere. And so photos and pieces of artwork and um, quite useful ways to pick out some colors for your, your data days. We've got um, some orange juice, which is orange. Great. And um, we've got some vitamin C, which is also orange. And this is part of the challenge with this plot. Uh, but it's a kind of more red and aggressive orange, and you can almost kind of taste it um, <laughs> when you see the colour. So we want to find a red that's a bit more aggressive, orange that's a bit more aggressive. Um, and then those green leaves look quite nice with those colours, so that might be quite a nice thing to base our text on. So we're going to head over to imagecolorpicker.com, or you can use any other colour extractor that you want. Um, and you can point at the different colours, and it will allow you to find the hex codes that correspond to them. So here are the hex codes that we're going to be using. Um, the orange juice we're going to take from what was in the glass. And I love the fact that it's called Fab 909. I think that's a great name for a color. So we're going to start with our orange juice, which is nice and orange. We're then going to create our vitamin C color by blending in one of the kind of darker oranges that we had with the built-in red color. Um, and we're going to pick this one in the middle here. And then I said for the text that we were going to start from the um, the green. So we're going to take the green and go darker. Um, and I'm using monochroma for this, which is a package that I wrote to manipulate colors and blend them together and go darker and go lighter. Um, so we're going to blend in um, so that it goes darker to create a dark text color. And then from that, we're going to go lighter to create some light text colors um, as well. 
And once we've done all of that, um, we can put them together and we have a color palette that will help us tell the story of this orange juice and vitamin C. So here's the plot as we had it. And we're going to go ahead and add the colors in. And I'm just starting to relax a little bit already that the colors make a lot more sense. Um, and I don't feel like I'm quite as tied to the annotations as I was um, earlier. We're then going to use transparency as a way of communicating the dose that the guinea pigs were given. But the lightest bar here is far too light. So we're going to have to put a bit of a range limiter um, on that alpha, which we can do using scale alpha. Um, and then I really struggle to remember what the doses were in, what unit is it? And we know that we've got the data set and we can quickly go and look it up, but you don't want to add that extra step um, to somebody who's just looking at your plot. So we are going to create a little labeling function that can sit inside um, what goes into the X axis. And all it does is it pastes the dose followed by milligrams per day, which is what they were given. So let's have a look at what that did. So you can see here on the X axis, rather than just having 0 0.5, 1 and 2, we've now got the units um, added in. A nice little trick just to make it easy for, for your readers. Um, we can then get rid of the legend because the legend was always redundant. Um, we've got two facets and we've labeled them correctly. So we don't really need it. Um, and then in looking at this, I don't know what it is. I think it's because doses are increasing and going up and there's just too many things heading in the same direction. Um, I tried to flip it to see if that helped. And I found this so much less confusing to look at. So you've got the doses that go up alongside and then you've got the length of the teeth um, <laughs> that go up. Um, horizontally and I, I just I find that a little bit easier to to look at to make sense of this data so here we go we haven't even done any annotating but we've already got a much clearer story going on um, in our data just through using the colors and the orientation purposefully now you were here to find out about annotations so let's get to that we're going to add a bit of text hierarchy to our plot and um, text hierarchy is illustrated really well um, in this, um, this diagram. So the idea is that the way that we format our text directs our, lead, our readers as to what is most important to read, what they can skip over, and um, what's just um, maybe nice to read if they've got time to, what the main story really is. And we can harness some of that in creating our plots. Um, and to do that, we need to play around with the theme. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do, because the text is quite small um, when it's done in these presentations, is make the theme, um, the base size of the text a little bit bigger inside theme minimal. Um, and then to make the code more legible, I'm going to make this a step. So we're going to create this as our basic plot, and then we're going to call it here. And from now on, basic plot is, is this. Okay, so you can see the text a little bit bigger. Um, because I've added the base size equals 15 into, into theme minimal. And now we're going to start building onto this. So we're going to make our basic text color um, be that light text that we determined earlier. Um, it's a slightly lighter gray, um, and it will allow us to then add the title in a slightly darker color. Now, this is really subtle. Um, it really is subtle, but it does make a difference. Um, and actually, we're going to build on that by changing the contrast, uh, by adding some bold and changing the relative size of the text as well. So you can increase the size of your plot title either by giving it a size as in, you know, size 22 or 16, which defaults to uh, points, or you can give it relative sizes, such as here, 1.5. Now, the beauty of doing that is that if you create all your plots and realize oh, the text is too small across all of them, all you have to do is change your base size that we set earlier, and all the annotations will update their sizes accordingly. And um, so we're going to say that we want the title to be one and a half times bigger than the base size. Um, and we're going to set the face to bold just to make it stand out a little bit more again. And um, we're then going to change our fonts uh, because it's quite nice to move away from default fonts. I think that's one of the things that people get a bit scared about doing, but it makes a really big difference to, um, to your plots. And especially if you're wanting things to be instantly recognizable as having come from you or from your lab, um, finding a font that aligns with the way that you've branded the rest of your stuff is, is well worth doing. Um, so these are the two fonts that I've picked um, for these plots, which align nicely with the rest of the fonts that I tend to use. Um, and you can see already we've got a bit of text hierarchy coming in. We're then going to apply that also to the strip text. 
Um, and we've got a nicely annotated plot. Now, choosing fonts is tricky. And so here are some resources. You can go to your brand guidelines if you work somewhere where there's a graphic designer that has given those, go for it. That is a huge time saver. And there's a brilliant article on Data Wrapper about choosing your um, fonts, making sure they're not too wide or too narrow to use in the data viz. Um, you can have a look at somebody else's website and think, oh, that's a nice combination. Um, use your inspector tool to figure out what fonts they've used. Um, and the resource that I recommend for everybody is um, Oliver Schundler's Font Matrix. Um, he gives a really good explanation of what makes fonts work well um, together. So take that, apply it with the principles of the data wrapper, which is specifically to do with data viz, um, and you'll be on, onto a good path with your fonts. The other thing about fonts that's tricky is actually getting them to work. Um, things have moved on a lot recently. So if you tried fonts, you know, two or three years ago and decided I am never doing this again, um, give it another go because things have evolved. Um, and the, the current wisdom is to make sure you've got the fonts installed locally. Um, and then you want to install system fonts as a package, which should install the dependencies of rag and text shaping. And um, make sure you set your graphic device to AGG in your RStudio options. I can have a look at that later if you want. Um, and then hope that it all works. And normally it does, uh, but every now and then you have a font that's got a, a name that trips up either Windows or Mac or various things, and it can be a bit, a bit fiddly, but it's much less fiddly than it used to be, and I think well worth the effort. Um, right, we've given our fonts different sizes, but everything's still looking a little bit cramped. So we're going to adjust um, the, the line height. Um, and we can feed that into the themes and we're going to give a margin around the um, title, a margin around the subtitle, and same around the strip text as well. And there we go. That looks a lot nicer. Um, it's a lot easier to read. Um, it doesn't, it's got just as much information in it, but it doesn't feel cluttered like, the, like it did earlier. Um, so there we go. We've added some text hierarchy. Uh, we can then get rid of the y-axis title because we don't need it. We've said that it's a dose, and so let's just get rid of that. Um, now, the thing to watch out for is that if you make your title really big, um, it's going to pop off the end of the screen. And some of you might have noticed the slightly weird indentation that I've been going for here. Again, that's because it wasn't fitting and you had to hit return um, at some point. So our title has totally gone off the edge of the plot here um, because we have made it too big. Um, but <clears throat> there is a wee easy fix to that, which is another reason why um, I love DG Text. So we'll talk about that just now. Even if you didn't, if you have your, your, your title and it's all in one go, um, it goes off the edge of your plot, which is really, really annoying. So we are going to add <clears throat> GG Text into the mix. There we go. So ggtext has a function inside it. I already love ggtext, but I found out about this extra function in preparing for this talk. Um, this is the function. It's called element text box simple. Um, and what it does is it, it allows you to keep all the slidings that you had before. Um, but on top of that, it wraps your text so that it fits inside your plot. So let's give that a go. Ta-da, magic. And um, so we now have a text in the title that fits, even though we've made it bigger. The subtitle fits nicely, and if you try this and resize the plot, um, it just resizes at the, the box that it fits in as you go. So it's a real time saver. So GG text element text box simple um, is absolutely brilliant. And the last thing I'm going to look at for the text hierarchy is that we can harness the power of HTML and CSS um, to do a bit of coding um, on the text to change the format on the fly. So if you have a look um, at this bit of code that I've put um, at the top of our screen. Um, you can see that when, it, when we render it, we can change the color and we can change the size um, as we go, um, which is great. And the fun thing that we can do with that is pull in the colors that we have decided on earlier. So we know we've got orange with that fab color. We know we've got the vitamin C with slightly more aggressive red, ready orange, um, and we can pull those into our text. Oop, and we go by pasting them in. So what we need to do is add these little span indicators. The double asterisk here just makes everything bold, but actually it's already bold, so I didn't need to do that. Um, never mind. Um, so we're pasting in the, the text and we're pasting the color that we've used. Um, and that allows us to do these changes to the color on the fly, which I think are, are quite a neat way 
uh, especially if you've got rid of your legend of just orienting your readers while they're having a look at, at your plot. So there we go. We've added a bit of text hierarchy. Um, and I think you can see for yourselves that it's decluttered our plot while retaining all the information. Um, and it helps us to see the main things that we should be looking for. And your, your main story is already starting to, to come out. So that's tip number two. Um, tip number three is to try to reduce unnecessary eye movement. Um, so here's the plot that we have, um, and we've made it easier to understand the story, but we're going to now make it even easier for the readers to compare values. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is just expand the, the way that the bars sit on it. Um, and then we're going to add um, some more formatting to our uh, strip text and just move it to the side. It just moves it out of the way, but keeps it actually where it needs to be for us to make sense of the data. Um, and now we're going to add in some text boxes. So the second thing from tech, ggtext that I love is the geom text box. It's absolutely brilliant, really versatile, and you can do all that markdown formatting within it as well. So in setting up our theme plot earlier, we already said that X was dose and Y was the mean length. So we've got that sorted. We don't need to reiterate that here. All we need to do is add in a label. So let's take a look and see what that does. OK, so we've got some text boxes, probably not formatted the way that we want them to, but they're here. And you've got the values sitting at the right places um, within your, your plots. And as you can see, um, the, the labels are aligned so that they are kind of centered on the point to which they correspond. And um, so that's why they sit kind of over the edge of, of the bar there. What we need to do is fix our alignments. So we're going to change the size to make it more easy to read. And then we're going to use H align and H just. So one of them uh, moves the box so that it aligns. Um, yeah, so it aligns like this to its coordinate. And the other one moves the text so that it aligns to that side of the box. I can never remember which one's which. So I created an alignment cheat sheet that you're more than welcome to consult and to use um, for your own purposes. But all this is doing is moving the boxes so that rather than aligning in the middle and having the text aligning on the left of the box, um, it aligns everything in a way that makes more sense. We're then going to remove the fill of the box and the outline color. And then we've got our boxes here. And then we're going to apply the fonts that we had earlier, uh, because why not make it consistent? Um, and we've made them white. Now, in doing so, we've come up with a problem which is that it's really hard to see um, the white text over the light yellow background. We also might have a problem if our data set were to change and say the 0.5 dose resulted in very minimal tooth growth, then we wouldn't have enough room for that label to stick. So um, we're going to do a few fun things um, to make these annotations work um, with the data and work with the colors that we've given them. We are going to put some conditional adjustments and alignments in. So what we've done here is we've moved um, the horizontal adjustment and horizontal alignment inside the aesthetic call here. And we're saying that if the mean length is less than 15, then we're going to align it one way. Um, and if it's if it's the other way around, then we're going to align it the other way around. And same with the alignment. So if it's less than 15, align it, align it zero. And if it's more than 15, then align it one. Does that make, I hope that made sense. Um, we will see. So this is what this does. We've got the plots where the length was less than 15 have a different alignment to the plots where the length was greater than 15, which works really nicely. And um, I changed the color out again, just so that we can make sure that we see, we saw everything was, because otherwise this would be white on a white background and then we would not see where the labels are. But the next thing that we can do is even more fun. We can do a bit of color, color conditioning um, based again on these values. So we can say if the length is greater than 15, so remember that's for the longer bars, we'll make the text white. Um, and otherwise, we will make it the text that corresponds to the supplement. So we'll make it either that uh, orange juice color or the vitamin C color. So let's have a go and see what's happened. This is not the result that I expected. And um, I'm afraid to say it took me longer than I'd like to admit to figure out what was going on here. And um, what has happened is that we've given it a fill scale uh, but we need to give it, um, we need to tell it to use color scale identity, because otherwise what it's doing is it's transforming the white, the orange juice and the vitamin C colors 
into levels of a factor and then assigning default ggplot colors to the, the colors here. So let's go ahead and add scale color identity. And ta -da, there we go. We've got our uh, text boxes that are aligned conditionally and also colored um, conditionally. Why not, while we're at it, add a little bit more information to these text boxes and do it with some text hierarchy. So we can, here, we're going to add in the dose with the unit and we're going to use the span to make sure that the dose is written smaller um, than what the length ends up being. And we're going to add the units in for the length as well. And there we go. That's what that this piece of code does. So we've got more information in our text boxes, but still um, with that styling that we need to help us orient ourselves as we're looking at it. Now, at this point, you might think, well, that's great, but why on earth would I do that? I can do this with Figma or you know, MS Paint or whatever other tool, maybe Excel, um, whatever other tool you want to be using. Um, you can, you can, um, but this is to avoid the scenario where suddenly your colleague comes in and says, hey, you know that data set that we'd lost? I found it um, and I've added, I've added it back into the data and recalculated the means and it, like it changes the data, but you know, the story is the same, but you will need to readjust the plots. And inside you're thinking, well, I mean, yay for science, but oh goodness, no, I have spent so much time trying to get this sorted. Um, Having these done programmatically avoids these kind of scenarios because it means that your text boxes, the content will adjust, the, the way that they're aligned will adjust, and everything should just work um, because it's based on the data rather than being based on where you've moved it to um, on the screen. So that's why it's worth doing this kind of stuff. Um, it's easier than you think, and I think it makes a big difference, and it makes you a bit of a hero um, for, your, for your colleagues as well um, if you can get this kind of stuff sorted. We've got two more tips to go and then a bonus track if we have time, but these are these are much quicker, I promise. Um, so the fourth tip is to try and highlight some important elements. So to do that, um, we're going to use a scatter plot. I said earlier, if you're panicking about the fact that I've turned the dose into a categorical variable, do not panic. We are coming back to that. By this point in the talk, you already know how to get from here to here. We've covered um, all of that and the, the code will be made available um, on my website if you want to have another look at how to do that on a different plot. Um, and what we're going to do is introduce you to Geom text path at this point. Now, this is another great package. Um, and what you do is you say, um, take a line and smooth it and give it a label, which is supplement. And all it does is this. So there you go, an easy way of making sure that you've labeled your data nicely and it gives your people another way of seeing what corresponds to what color, but these are not the right colors, are they? So let's go and change that um, and we'll change it so that it aligns nicely. And again, we've got the orange juice and the vitamin C. Now we need to make sure that we move it to a place that's sensible. Remember, try to reduce that unnecessary eye movement and add in the formatting with the fonts that we've taken the care to choose um, earlier. So that's the old text path. Um, and I think it does a really good job. Now, let's add some more text boxes in, just because we can, and we've decided that that's a fun thing to do. So we've got text boxes here, and this time we're going to do some um, alignment that's conditional, both vertical and horizontal, um, to make sure that they're coming in from a sensible place. So again, we're using case when, which is a brilliant function for this. So if the dose is smaller than 1.5, um, then you want to make it the coordinate of the box dose plus 0.005. And if the if it's the other way around, change the alignment, etc. I'm not going to spend too much time picking through the code, but you can get the gist of it. We're, we're basically using is it a maximum or is it a minimum to decide does the box sit above or underneath um, the points. We're using the pasting and the CSS that we looked at earlier to do the content of the box, and then the alignments that we looked at earlier um, to move the text inside the box as well. So let's take a look at what we have. So here we go. We've got these boxes. So if it's a maximum of the, the group, um, then the box is above. If it's, it's a minimum of the group, the box is below. And um, if the dose is greater than 1.5, we have aligned it on this side. If the dose is smaller, then we've aligned it on this side. Um, and then we've pulled in some names that some of you might recognize that these are taken from the Bake Off package. Um, I thought it'd be fun to just combine the make off that we started with and the, the tooth growth packages as well. Um, and there we have our labels. Now, sometimes less is more. So we're just going to get rid of a few of those labels. Um, you don't want to overwhelm your readers either. And then we can use the same principle 
to add in some arrows. So here we've got um, some conditional statements as to where the arrows start and where the arrows end, uh, both um, horizontally and also um, vertically, so that we can decide what we're going to do with that. So let's have a look and see how they look. Here are our arrows. Now the default curvature that comes in with geom curve is 0.5, um, which I find to be often just too aggressive in, in its curve. So we're going to adjust that uh, to 0.1, which looks okay, but I'm a bit frustrated by the fact that they kind of swoop in the, the wrong way. We'll come back to that later. For now, we're going to put them at zero and we've got our arrows um, that are just pointing at the data points straight from the label, which is a nice way to do it as well. So here we go, we've, we're nearly there and we have come a long way, um, even from a nicely themed plot to a plot with some annotations that point out the important patterns and also help orient your readers through that geom text path. Tip number five, really quick one, see how much you can declutter. Uh, be brave, try theme void, <laughs> see if you get rid of everything because your plot still makes sense. Do you need the grid? Is there any text that you don't need? And are there any colors that you've used that don't fit with your color scheme? Um, I think the void theme actually works quite well for the bar plot that we created earlier because we've got the values inside the bars and they are underneath. I think the grid lines become a bit redundant, but um, different people and different journals have different opinions about these things. So you have to work within the parameters that people are comfortable with, but try to push it a little bit and see, see how far you get. Uh, we're going to change the color of our grid um, and align it using a lighter version of our text color uh, to declutter and then add a little bit of margins around it. And there we go. We have a slightly decluttered version of the same plot, again, with the same information, which all makes sense. Um, I've got just a few more slides, and then we'll move on to the, the, uh, the Q&A. Uh, the bonus track. So we've got GG Highlight, T-Pipe, and some curved arrows. GG Highlight is for that situation where you've got too many different conditions, and you just want to highlight a few of them. Um, this is what's on the... Um, the page from the creators of the package, but actually the best example I think of this recently has been Nicola Rennie's Hollywood age gap plot, um, where she used that to highlight the different points um, that she was talking about. Go and find out more um, at the tweet, uh, where you can also find the code to the plot that she created. T-pipe, um, I'll just leave this here and we'll run through it quickly, but it's a way of pausing your pipe so that you can create some labels on the fly, and then you resume your flight pipe and plot it into your ggplot. That's why I keep using this pipe rather than the native pipe. We'll get there in some, at some point, but for now it doesn't have the t-pipe option, which I find quite useful for this. And finally, conditional curvatures. We can't feed the curvature into the aesthetic call. Um, it only sits outside here. So one way around it is to figure out um, a filtering system. So here we're gonna say, if it's the maximum, do a minus one curve. If it's the minimum, um, then do a plus 0.1 curve, and then we can plot that. So we've got our curves coming in uh, nicely either side of the, the points, I think is good. Gets a bit unwieldy. So here's another option for you to look at in your own time. And now uh, it's over to you. That's all I have to share. So I will stop the screen share.